okay so we ended the last group theory video with this result let us briefly recall what this result i mean we have the statement here but for the sake of brevity let's see the entire thing in just symbols what we have here is a group g a subgroup h of g and the set s of all the right cosets of h in g the result says that there exists a homomorphism theta of g into the permutation group a of s of the set s such that the kernel of theta k theta is the largest normal subgroup of g contained in h the kernel of theta being the kernel of a homomorphism is normal that we know and uh, that we already know and we don't really need this result for that conclusion what this result says additionally is that k theta is not merely a normal subgroup of g but it is the largest among those normal subgroups of g that are contained in a not the largest normal subgroup of G, okay. Uh, I mean, not necessarily. So among those normal subgroups of G that are subsets of H, K theta is the largest. So that's what this result says. So today in this video, we are going to see how one can use this result to say things about normal subgroups of G. More specifically, when G can have or cannot have non-trivial normal subgroups in it. So the things start like this. The case H equal to E just yields Cayley's theorem that is the first result of this section. So in the special case where this subgroup H becomes the trivial group, we get Cayley's theorem. How? Let us see if we take H to be the trivial group, then because of this inclusion, the kernel is forced to also become the trivial group. And recalling that when this happens, the homomorphism in question is one to one, we have this theta is one to one it is injective and hence it's an isomorphism now that theta has become an isomorphism g becomes isomorphic to its image under theta g theta which is nothing but a subgroup of a of s so that means we have embedded g inside a of s or more loosely speaking we have found G inside AFS, a copy of G inside AFS, isomorphic copy. And that is nothing but Cayley's theorem. So we see that Cayley's theorem is a special case of this more general result. Now we are going to see how this result can be used. Let us consider this situation. Note that everything starts from this subgroup H, which is our choice actually. In this result, the H that we have, even after choosing G, we, we have uh, some choices for H. We can uh, choose H to be different subgroups of G. 
So everything starts from age. Now if our choice is like this, if age should happen to have no normal subgroup of G, other than uh, the trivial group. in it then theta is an isomorphism if h has that property then theta is an isomorphism theta must be an isomorphism of G into A of S. In this case, we would have cut down the size of the set S in the proof of our Cayley's theorem. Okay. Now this situation is gone. We have seen that when H is the trivial subgroup, then we get Cayley's theorem. So let's just wrap this up. Now H has something else. I mean, uh, H has some other property. Now our H is such that the only normal subgroup of G that is inside H is the trivial group. Okay, now in this new situation also we will get k theta equal to the trivial group. Why? Because we know that k theta is contained in H and is a normal subgroup of G. Now because the only normal subgroup of G now inside H is E. So k theta must be equal to E. There is no other choice. Again the rest of the things are same because k theta is the trivial group e again theta becomes an isomorphism so that's what we have written here and what this line says in this case we would have cut down the size of the s in the proof of theorem 291 what this means is this let us quickly recall what we did in the proof of Cayley's theorem in Cayley's theorem, we started with a group G. Our aim was to identify G inside some permutation group A of S for some set S. In this theorem, in the proof what we did, in place of S, we chose G itself. And then we managed to find an isomorphism psi if you go back to that proof you will see which gave us the isomorphic copy g psi of g inside a of g but after achieving this we realized something that a of g is very large very very much large compared to g this becomes uh, much more understandable when G is finite. Say G has n elements, then A of G 
has n factorial elements now if g itself is quite large to begin with if n is large then n factorial is also large much much larger than n so although we have identified g inside a more concrete group we have identified the abstract group inside a more concrete permutation group but at the same time the disadvantage is that we have lost g inside of this very big group g has only n elements whereas the environment in which now g is lying or rather its copy is lying same thing that environment is extremely huge so it's like dropping a stone in a lake instead of uh, having it there in front of you and then losing it it's like that so naturally we we then try to choose a smaller s in a of s and that's how we ended up with this theorem now in this case what we did instead of taking i can show it here itself now instead of taking the entire g as our s we chose to take the collection of right cosets of a subgroup of g as our s and we have found a homomorphism theta that gives us a homomorphic image of g inside a of s this is not quite uh, the same as a replica group theoretic replica of g like what we have in kelly's theorem not necessarily but something similar to g however even in this case if it happens that our h the subgroup that we chose does not have any normal subgroup of g other than the trivial group then again we are getting isomorphism in this uh, in that case the object which looks like g not entirely group theoretically identical actually does become identical okay theta becomes an isomorphism so g theta becomes an isomorphic image of g inside a of s but unlike uh, kelly's theorem now something else has also happened now our a of s is not as large as a of g in what sense have we uh, somewhat cut down the size of a of s it is this you see when you choose the entire g in a of g what 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 are the elements the elements are permutations of g that is one to one mappings one to one onto mappings on g so when we are considering g we are considering its elements or its points separately however when we introduce a subgroup inside g what this subgroup does uh, in while proving lagrange's theorem we have already seen this that the subgroup generates a partition of g into disjoint right cosets of that subgroup and when you are considering this set whose elements are those right cosets what you are doing is that in uh, h for example there there are some elements of g instead of considering those elements as different now we are considering all of them as a single point so it's like those elements have all collapsed to give you a single point and the same thing happens in the other right cosets of h there are many collapses all of these separate compartments are now considered as single entities so essentially instead of having g we have a much smaller set okay so that's how 
S is smaller than G and correspondingly now our A of S is smaller than the original A of G that we have in Cayley's theorem. So we have now identified the abstract group G inside a concrete permutation group but also not a very unimaginably large permutation group but a somewhat more manageable one. So th that is one situation if note that this whole thing is conditional if such an H can be found which has this property. Next part. Next naturally will come the question of uh, whether one can actually find such an H. However, before we get to that, there are some more things the author says. This is interesting. This is interesting mostly for finite groups for we shall use this observation both as a means of showing certain finite groups have non-trivial normal subgroups and also as a means of representing starting finite groups as permutation groups on small sets. So this whole thing, all these considerations can be used to use for two purposes. One, using the tools and techniques we are seeing here, we can say, we can uh, conclude that some given finite groups have non-trivial normal subgroups. And sometimes we can also uh, identify a given group inside a permutation group, concrete permutation group on small step. That is our original purpose that we have in Cayley's theorem. Also, uh, although uh, we don't uh, necessarily have that smallness there, that sometimes we can uh, rectify if we have, for example, such an age. And an offshoot of this uh, analysis is that we can sometimes also ascertain that starting finite groups have non-trivial normal subgroups.
Okay, now comes the question of when such subgroups H can be found. We now examine the above remarks. a little more closely. Suppose G is a finite group that has a subgroup H such that the index of H factorial is strictly less than the order of G. Okay. Why suddenly we are considering such uh, an apparently arbitrary inequality it will become clear very soon. So we now have a finite group G which has a subgroup H that satisfies this inequality. Then theta from G into A of S is uh, the permutation, I, I mean sorry, what the hell am I saying, is the homomorphism that we have in theorem 292 is not an isomorphism. This is because If theta is an isomorphism, if theta were an isomorphism, we would have this. order of A of S. S is what? S is the set of all right cosets of H in G. Keep in mind that now our G is a finite group. So unlike the general case where G is any group, we now know exactly how many right cosets there are of H in G. And that number is index of H in G. We have already come across this number when we proved Lagrange's theorem and it turned out that this number is nothing but the order of G divided by the order of H. Also don't forget one thing that it is not given that H is a normal subgroup. So the S that we are considering here is not the quotient group G by H. In fact, the quotient group G by H may not make sense because we don't know whether H is normal or not. All we have is the set of right cosets of H in G, that is S. But despite uh, not having possibly a group structure, we know how many elements S has. And that number is this okay index of h in g so if s has this many elements how many elements will a of s have 
have uh, will have this number factorial number of elements that is this okay and that according to our condition is strictly less than the order of g however because we are insisting that theta is a home is an isomorphism so order of g will be the same as the order of the image of g under theta and this g theta is clearly contained in this a of s so its order should be less than or equal to the order of a of s so what are we getting the order of a of s is strictly less than the order of a of s that is and this is not possible And this impossibility is the reason why theta cannot be an isomorphism. Okay. So the statement that theta is not an isomorphism is now justified. It, it is true. But now what is the consequence of that? Now, Since theta is not an isomorphism, we have the kernel of theta not equal to the trivial group because otherwise theta will be an isomorphism. We already know that. Thus, if our h, the h that we have chosen, which satisfies this inequality, additionally also satisfies this, if our h is not equal to g, then k theta is a non-trivial normal subgroup of G contained in H. That is G has a non-trivial normal subgroup. Non-trivial because k theta is already different from the trivial group uh, consisting of only the identity element but at the same time because h is not equal to g and k theta is by theorem 292 contained in h so k theta at the same time is not equal to g as well so that's why k theta is a non-trivial normal subgroup of g and it is contained in h so if such a subgroup can be found then g has a non-trivial normal subgroup so that's what we were mentioning back there now the question is can such an h be found which satisfies this inequality let's just roughly try to understand how large h should be in order for this inequality to be true in vague terms okay 
you see looking at this inequality one thing becomes immediately clear that index of h should be small compared to the order of g so small that even the factorial of the index of h is smaller than the order of g now index of h is small means what this quotient is small so that means h itself should be very large h should be almost like g maybe a little smaller than g it should be smaller than g because at the same time h uh, should not be equal to g okay so that much we can say about h if it uh, seems for now that such an it, it is almost impossible to find such an age we will actually show such an age in the applications of these ideas okay that is coming however one doesn't really need this inequality in order for uh, concluding this something else which is not this much stringent also works and that is uh, the next thing however the argument used above has implications even when this factorial is not smaller than the order of g and the alternative condition is this if order of g does not divide we have to think of an alternative because it's really difficult to keep a factorial small so the alternative is this if order of g does not divide in the index of h factorial then since the order of a of s is index of h factorial invoking lagrange's theorem we can conclude that a of s cannot have a subgroup of order o of g now the index of h factorial is not necessarily less than the order of g but the order of g does not divide the index of h factorial even when it is greater than the order of g but because this number is the order of a of s so lagrange's theorem says 
that the group AFS does not have a subgroup whose order is equal to the order of G of order this. But AFS does have the subgroup G theta hence order of G theta is not equal to the order of G which implies theta is not again we have come to that same conclusion theta is not an isomorphism thus k theta is not equal to the trivial group and so G has a non trivial normal subgroup contained in H provided. H itself is different from G. Now we uh, are not uh, restricted to choose H very large so that index of H is very small so that its factorial is less than order of G. But we have to uh, make sure that whatever this factorial becomes depending on our choice of H, it is not divisible by order of G then again we are getting the same conclusion and we are going to summarize this conclusion as a lemma which we will use. This is lemma 291 and it just says what, whatever we have said above. If G is a finite group And H are different from G is a subgroup of G such that order of G does not divide index of H factorial. If these things happen, then H must contain a non-trivial normal subgroup of G. In particular, G is not simple. Recall that a simple group is a group in which the only normal subgroups are the group and the trivial group consisting of the identity. These are the only two normal subgroups. 
no other normal subgroup exists. Okay, so these are all the results in this section. Now, how one can apply these things in order to say non-trivial things about a given group? So there come the applications. That's how it's given in the text. So I also write like that. The first application is this. Let G be a group of order 36. Exactly what group we don't know, some group of order 36. We also don't know whether G is abelian or non-abelian. Such uh, information is not given to us. Suppose G has a subgroup H of order 9. If you are wondering, uh, is that possible? The answer is that uh, that is always possible, which we will see uh, much later. Whatever G is, if its order is 36, we can always find a subgroup H of order 9. We shall see later. That this is always the case. Okay. Then what is index of h factorial? We immediately see what happens to this thing. Uh, that is, uh, what is the relationship between this number and the order of g? Because h has 9 elements, so its index is 36 divided by 9, 4. In fact, let's just show that. The 4 factorial is 24 and 24 is less than 36 which is the order of g. So you see that uh, the thing that we were uh, wondering about uh, there whether such an h actually exists. Yes, this is one situation. Thus, by Lemma, oh, I forgot to mention one thing. You see, Lemma 291 includes in itself this condition also. When index of h factorial is less than the order of g, then also this divisibility relation is true then also order of g cannot divide the index of h factorial simply because it's greater than index of h factorial. So in this case also the hypothesis of lemma 291 is true. So we can uh, see the conclusion. Thus by lemma 291 there is 
a normal subgroup n which is different from the trivial group of g contained in h one more thing you should uh, note is that our h is not equal to g h has nine elements g has 36 elements so there should be such a normal subgroup n something more can also be said about this n things order of h is 9 and n is a subgroup of h and is contained in h so by lagrange's theorem we must have order of n equal to 3 or order of n equal to 9 order of n cannot be 1 because of this condition application 2 let g be a group of order 99 suppose G has a subgroup of order 11 or oh, subgroup uh, let's call it H H of order 11 We shall also see later that this is always the case. We will see these things when we get to Stiller's theorem. Okay. So now in our group of order 99, we have a subgroup H of order 11. Since order of G equal to 99. does not divide index of h factorial which is what nine factorial by lemma 291 there exists a normal subgroup n of g
contained in H. Okay, 99 does not divide 9 factorial. You don't actually have to calculate 9 factorial in order to verify this. That is because 9 factorial divided by 99 is what? Seven, etc. Two, one. Eleven does not divide this product because we know that eleven is a prime number. So, if it has to divide such a product, it should divide at least one factor, all of which are less than eleven. So that's why ninety-nine does not divide nine factorial. So in this case, you see that our uh, index of h factorial is not unlike this one it is not less than order of g but still order of g does not divide the number so we are able to again use lemma 291 to conclude this since order of h is 11 which is a prime we must have order of n also equal to 11 because n being contained in h is a subgroup of h so by Lagrange's theorem order of n should divide the order of h and uh, there are only two possibilities because 11 is a prime order of n can either be 1 which it cannot be because of this condition so it has to be equal to 11 but then n must be equal to h and so h itself is normal So in a group of order 99, a subgroup of order 11, which we are saying exists, we will see later, that must be normal. And then there is one more. application 3 let g be a okay this time it's given that the group is non abelian of order 6 okay now note that the order of g is even and in a in an exer exercise 11 of section 223, two, the third section of uh, this second chapter, the ex exercise 11 says this, if G is a finite group whose order is even, then there exists a non-identity element in G such that the square of that element is identity. In other words, there exists an element of order 2 in any group, any finite group with even order. But this is one such group. by exercise 11 
section 2-3 there exists an element a not equal to the identity in G such that a square is the identity then H which is defined to be the cyclic subgroup of G generated by A which will have only these two elements because the order of A is 2. Note one thing carefully that this equation alone does not say that the order of A is 2. This along with this says that the order of A is 2. Then this is a subgroup of G of order 2. Now in this third example we are not assuming the existence of H like those uh, first two applications. But here we are uh, actually we have shown that such an H exists. But what shall we do with this H? Suppose for we should not say suppose for the time being because this is something that is true. Suppose we know that H is not normal. Okay. Let us calculate the index of H and do all these things that we have been doing in the other calculations, other applications. Since the index of H factorial is going to be what? Order of G is 6 divided by order of h is 2 this is equal to 3 factorial that is equal to 6 oh but uh, this is divisible by the order of g no? so how are we supposed to use this Do I have any idea of that here? Oh, that's not what we are doing. Okay, we are uh, going towards something else. Since index of h factorial is equal to this, which is 6, and theta maps g into a of s, where a of s has this order. Mm -hmm. but okay 
how do we make sure that the theta that we have from theorem 292 in this case is an isomorphism? Does it somehow follow from H itself? Oh, we have to use this condition, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, before writing these things about order, we write this. So, uh, somehow, suppose we know that this H is not normal, then The only normal subgroup of G in H is the trivial group E. So the kernel of theta which uh, will lie inside H and is normal is now forced to become equal to E because that is the only normal subgroup. It is that condition that we uh, were mentioning back then. And hence our theta will be an isomorphism. Hence the homomorphism theta of G into A of S where S is the usual set of all right cosets of H in G is an isomorphism. Okay. Thus, G is isomorphic to the subgroup. Note that order of AFS is equal to what? Index of H factorial. Now we have to carry out that computation. Okay, this is one thing and order of t which is order of g theta which is nothing but the order of g itself is also 6 thus g is isomorphic to t and T is equal to AFS because T is a subgroup of AFS and it has turned out that T and AFS have the same number of elements. So T must be equal to AFS. And uh, okay, now 
how many elements does s have s is the set of all right cosets of h in j because the index of h is 3 so there are three right cosets of h in g so s has three elements so a of s is nothing but s3 so we seem to have shown that g is isomorphic to s3 but we are not quite there because of this supposition suppose we know that this h that we have considered here or found here is not normal so we have almost shown that the arbitrary non-abelian rule g of order 6 is isomorphic to s3 The only missing part is the proof that H is not normal. Now we are going to do that. In order to get a contradiction, we would suppose that H is normal. Suppose H is normal, then for any group element G we have G A G inverse belonging to H because small a is coming from H so normality uh, demands that this element also be in H. Since G A G inverse is not equal to the identity. So the only other only one more possibility is there that G A G inverse is equal to A. So that should be true. And by the way, why is this true? Because otherwise, if G A G inverse is identity, then A will become identity which it is not uh, recall that we have chosen a to be a non-identity element in g whose square is the identity we must have g a g inverse equal to a or G A equal to A G. Thus, every element of G
commutes with A. Now next part we do, we choose any element B in G that is not in H and such elements exist because G has 6 elements and H has only 2 elements. So there are 4 possible choices for B. Any such B has been chosen. Then something can be said about the normalizer of B. Now we consider the normalizer of B which by definition is the set of those elements in G that commute with B. Note one more thing that this B cannot be equal to A because A is there in H. It is something else. Also this B cannot be equal to identity. Since B E is equal to E B and B A is equal to A B, we have H contained in the normalizer. This of course is uh, something we already know, both of them will be equal to B. So identity commutes with B, in fact the identity element commutes with every element in every group, I mean in it, its group. Every element commutes with the identity. So the identity element will belong to the normalizer of B. But because we have already proved that every element commutes with A. In particular, B also commutes with A or the same thing A commutes with B and that's why A will also belong to the normalizer of B. So these are the two elements in H, E and A and they are both in the normalizer of B. So H now becomes a subgroup of the normalizer of B. Also, there is one more fact about this whole situation. H at the same time is not equal to the normalizer of B because B belongs to the normalizer of B naturally because B commutes with itself but B does not belong to H. That's how we have chosen B. Hmm. So H and N of B cannot be equal. Now why? Lagrange's theorem. 2 which is the order of H should divide the order of the normalizer of B because H is a subgroup of N of B and the order of the normalizer of B divides the order of G which is 6. Now combine all these things. 
This divisibility relation tells us that this order should be even. And along with this condition, uh, it we then also have the thing that it is not just even but it is greater than 2, it cannot be equal to 2. But at the same time, this number itself should divide 6. So, we must have the order of the normalizer equal to 6. There is no other choice. It divides 6 means it has to be less than or equal to 6. Now, less than or equal to 6, uh, there are only 3 even numbers, 2, 4 and 6. This cannot be 2, it has to be greater than 2, but it has to divide 6, so it cannot be 4 also, so the only possibility is 6. And thus, the normalizer of E is equal to G. Okay, what do we have now? All the elements of our group commute with A, right? In particular, the elements that are coming from outside like these things, they also commute with A and all of them also commute with the identity E, okay? Now, such elements which are coming from outside also commute with themselves, among themselves. Why? If you choose two such Bs, say B1 and B2, in G but not in H, then for both of them, the normalizers should be equal to G. We need only one, one of them, say, the normalizer of B1 is equal to G. Then, because B2 is coming from G, so B2 will belong to this normalizer, so B1 and B2 will commute. So, elements outside of H commute among themselves. Elements outside of H commute with the elements inside H, and the elements inside H also commute because H has only two elements, E and A. So, that means, Every element of G commutes with every other element. That is, G is abelian, which it is not. Okay, so we are going to directly conclude this. Therefore, every element of G commutes with every other element of G. That is G is abelian. Which is the which is a contradiction.
thus our supposition that h is normal in g is wrong and that's what we wanted to show so the missing piece that we have there in our proof that g is isomorphic to s3 has now been made available so now there is no gap now in uh, <coughs> all respects we have proved that any non-abelian group of order 6 is isomorphic to s3 that means up to isomorphism there is only one non-abelian group of order 6 that is s3 there is no other group and it is the unique up to isomorphism smallest non-abelian group because we have already proved in one uh, exercise before that any group whose order is at most 5 is abelian. Okay, so if someone asks you what is the smallest non abelian group, your answer should be S3. That's just it. So we uh, now see that uh, using the tools and techniques of this section, some such things uh, we have been able to conclude. Here the section ends, the applications end and let us now uh, see some one or two exercises. Let's start the exercises also. Let G be a group. Consider the mappings of G into itself. denoted by this lambda g defined for the element g belonging to g by this formula. When you apply lambda g on the group element x by definition that is the product gx for all x belonging to g. <coughs> Excuse me. Prove that lambda g is 1 to 1 and on to and that lambda g h is equal to equal to lambda h lambda g for all I don't think something else has been written it's understood that g and h are coming from the group so 
now we have some mappings like this that means uh, lambda g is left multiplication by g multiplication from the left hand side by g left hand side so lambda i don't know whether the author consciously wrote lambda because it stands it is the greek l uh, so it stands for multiplication by l, g from the left side i don't know whether that has been consciously done or not however it is convenient for us to remember the function like that we have to prove uh, first that lambda g is a bijection on g it's a one to one on to function on g and then this okay this is uh, not like do you remember we have already come across some other such functions in the proof of uh, Cayley's theorem itself tau g if g is a group element then this is also defined from g into itself and its definition was this It is right multiplication. Lambda is left multiplication. For such tau g, we proved this thing. And this fact, in fact, allowed us to define that map psi from g into a of g like this. g psi equal to tau g and this fact implies psi is a homomorphism and that's how we proved Cayley's theorem but now uh, something else is happening the order gets reversed for the lambdas so let's see the solution let's keep this for a moment the so first one-to-oneness and onto-ness let x and y be two group elements such that x lambda g is equal to y lambda g g is given that is understood g is the group element itself then gx is equal to gy which implies the left cancellation law in G that X is equal to Y. So the assumption that the outputs are equal have led us to the conclusion that the inputs are equal that means lambda G is 1 to 1. Also, for any group element, set belonging to G, there exists G inverse Z belonging to G such that
So this becomes equal to z using the various truth theoretic axioms and properties. So that means any element z is the image of some element under lambda g. That does this this onto. Finally, we have to prove this. Next, let G H and the K be any element in G. Besides G and H, we need some other element K because we want to see how these two functions, uh, I mean, when we apply them to K, what is their behavior? We have K lambda G H multiplication of k by g h from the left hand side using the associative law and the group this can be written as g h k now here we are multiplying the element h k from the left side by g so that means this is the lambda g image of h k just like that inside we have the lambda h image of k because this is multiplication of k by h from the left side. Now by the definition of composition of functions So that's just it. So we see that the effect of applying lambda g h on k and that of applying lambda h lambda g on k are the same. So as functions they are the same thing. So here it ends and in this context we should not forget that this thing lambda h lambda g is nothing but the composition okay now why are we not writing composition here why are we simply writing it as if it's multiplication that's because note that we have proved that the lambdas are one to one onto functions. That is, these two things belong to this. And we know that this is a group. And when we multiply two such things, the binary operation, the most natural one we have is function composition. But because we have already decided not to write any symbol for the binary operation, that is the multiplicative notation. No. So instead of mentioning or writing anything in between, we are just simply writing lambda h lambda g. Because in this group, lambda h lambda g means this thing. Next, we 
let lambda g be defined as in exercise 1 that means these things and tau g so these functions are coming from the proof of Cayley's theorem as in the proof of theorem 291 Prove that for any G and H belonging to our group, the mappings lambda G and tau H satisfy this fact. that they commute as elements in the permutation group any lambda g commutes with any tau h for this we just have to choose like this one k and apply these two functions on k or uh, we apply one of them and then show that that is equal to the uh, value of the other function also at k. Anything else we have been asked to show? No, just this equation commutation. we have k lambda g tau h now we have to be careful about which one does what first by the definition of function composition we have this lambda g means multiplication from the left side so g k And tau h means multiplication from the right side by h. So that is g k h. Now by the associative law, this is g times k h. Left multiplication by g is lambda g. So k h. lambda g and right multiplication by <coughs> excuse me h is tau h so k tau h and lambda g outside again by the definition of composition of mappings this is Okay, I hope I have written everything correctly. Yes. Hence, it has started raining finally.
lambda g tau h is equal to tau h lambda g how nice so here the solution ends exercise 3 becomes even more interesting if theta is a one-to-one -one mapping of G onto its self. such that theta lambda g is equal to lambda g theta. The author has written the other one first. Lambda g theta is equal to theta lambda g for all g belonging to g that means it's given that because theta is given to be a bijection on g so theta is an element in this permutation group this condition says that theta commutes with all lambda g's as an element of this permutation group then For all, okay, so we have started with if. Prove that theta actually equals tau h for some h belonging to g. In this exercise, we have shown that if you say fix some h in your group G, then tau h commutes with all the lambda g's. Now, so this is a sort of converse. If some theta in A of G in the permutation group commutes with all the lambda g's, then it must be some tau h. So the elements in A of G that commute with all the lambda g's are precisely the taus nothing else it cannot be anything else that's what these two things say together at once it may seem like something very complicated how can you think of h for what h you will get this however uh, you will now see that it becomes uh, extremely apparent what H should be for any K belonging to G we have so we use this commutation this relation Okay, this implies what k lambda g theta equal to k theta lambda g or theta we of course don't know what theta actually does to an element but lambda g we know 
this is left multiplication by g so g k theta is equal to g times k theta don't get confused by this equation this equation is not associative law theta is a mapping okay here on this side we have the image of theta uh, i mean sorry the image of the element gk under the mapping theta here on the right hand side however it's the product of these two group elements g and k theta where k theta itself is the image of k under theta in particular we have now uh, this is true for any element k in g if we take k equal to the identity then we have g e theta equal to g e theta that is g theta equal to g e theta now if you look carefully g e theta is right multiplication of g by the group element e theta that is why this is nothing but tau e theta we are right multiplying the group element g by e theta so g theta is equal to this and this is true for all g since this is true for all g belonging to g we have theta equal to tau e theta so theta equals that tau whose suffix is e theta e theta is the image of the identity element under theta so that completes the third one so uh, let's just end things here for now if you want to say something about these things you can write in the comment section below or you can mail me at my usual address uh, this coming friday we will have a field theory upload from uh, our strengths topics in algebra and then again uh, the usual thing on saturday we have exercises from gregory lee's uh, t lee's algebra and on sunday we have analysis after that the other things will again come one by one so that will be all for tonight uh, so see you on friday with field theory until then this is me lucifer from a mathematical room have a nice night